All right. Good morning, Town Church family. Great to see you today. You know, this is one of those Sundays, the Sunday after Easter. Uh, they always say oh, it's the least attended. You know, it's kind of like a gimme Sunday. Nobody wants to come. But you're all here today, uh, and that is wonderful. Uh, thank you for those who visited last week and came again uh, this week. It's really nice to have, have you back again. And just everybody who's here today, uh, what a joy to be together uh, and to worship God. I have some announcements to make. Um, about what's going on, what's going on within our church. Uh, the first is that on June 2nd, there's going to be a ladies' brunch uh, at the Fuller's house. Leah is not here today, um, but we've got her phone number on there. So uh, just put that on your radar, uh, something that's really fun to do, uh, and just to get together and hang out. So uh, June 2nd, uh, that'll be at the Fuller's house in on Humboldt Hill, so just south of town here. Um, in two weeks, we're going to have a potluck, so we get together once a month and have a meal together as a church following our worship gathering here, uh, and so on the 21st, we will have uh, a potluck family meal. We just spend time together, uh, and there'll be information coming out this week on the app, our church app, as to the theme of the meal and what people are bringing uh, and how to, you know, you know, we don't want to have too much of one thing, right? No. <laughs> Uh, and you want to plan what you're going to buy at Costco, right, uh, for the meal. So uh, just something I wanted to point out, looking back, uh, a, a couple weeks ago we had our last potluck and we had what we call a family meeting where we talk about all kinds of stuff. We do this a couple times a year. Uh, and one of the things that we talked about at the family meeting was uh, the need for volunteers within our church to serve in different aspects uh, whether it's greeting people in the front or uh, serving within our kids' ministry or uh, cleaning. And so we've had a great response uh, from people saying we want to we want to be involved, we want to help out, and really appreciate the response that we've got thus far. And I just want to encourage you, if you, were, if you were on the fence and you were like, oh, I meant to talk about it and I just kind of forgot about it, I uh, just want to encourage you, talk to Pastor Aaron. Uh, he's sitting back over here by the coffee table. Uh, if you want to look for other ways to serve, other ways to get involved, uh, and yeah, it's a great opportunity uh, to serve our church uh, in that way. And then just another thing I wanted to mention is we, we have talked about inviting people for Easter, be praying for people uh, coming up to Easter, and what I want to tell you is I, I want to encourage you to keep doing that. You know, yes, it, it does feel a little bit easier to invite people to a special Sunday like Easter or Christmas or something like that, but but the truth is, the most effective way to uh, tell somebody about your faith in Jesus is to invite them to come to church, and a lot of people are willing to do that. They're willing to explore Christianity. They're willing to find out what it is that you believe, especially if you're a friend, uh, if you have a relationship with them as a neighbor or a coworker or something like that. So I just want to encourage you to continue praying for people in your life. Uh, and to invite them to come on a Sunday uh, and to continue doing that. So um, I think that's all I have for announcements. So I want to invite Rick McCrosty up to lead us in our invitation and call to worship. Good morning. We do want to welcome you to Town Church, and we're glad that you are here. So please hear these words of invitation. Sinners, are you poor? Christ has gold to enrich you. Are you naked? Christ has royal robes. He has white raiment to clothe you. Are you blind? Christ has eye salve to enlighten you. Are you hungry? Christ will be manna to feed you. Are you thirsty? He will be a well of living water to refresh you. Are you wounded? He has a balm under his wings to heal you. Are you sick? He is a phys physician to heal you, to cure you. Are you prisoners? He has laid down a ransom for you. Ah, sinners, tell me, tell me, is there anything in Christ to keep you off from believing? No. Is there not everything in Christ that may encourage you to believe in him? Yes, yes. 
Please hear these words of truth from Psalm 24, verses 7 through 10. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. This is God's word. So please now let's stand and worship the Lord of hosts and the King of glory as we sing these songs together.
Would you join me in a word of prayer? Father God, we come before you as your people today, uh, redeemed and loved. We pray to you knowing that you hear us, that you listen, that you care and love us as your children. We read in your word, it says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And Father, as we reflect on these words, we look up to you, holy and righteous and perfect, and we can look around the room and see all the imperfections and all the sin that is here, and yet we know the truth of your word that teaches us that Jesus came and he became our sin, that it was nailed to the cross, that the, the righteous and just retribution against sin was taken care of on our behalf so that we could be clothed in your righteousness, perfect and holy. And you give this to us as a gift. God, we can never spend enough time praising you for this. And God, you've given us the opportunity to be ambassadors of reconciliation, messengers of the grace that we have been given to share with others it's a truly amazing thing that you've invited us to be a part of that. And so we pray for the town church um, as a collection, as a body of believers, that we would live this out, that we would both know the joy of the reconciliation that is in Jesus, that we would know the joy of having your righteousness given to us freely, even though we don't deserve it, and that we would know the joy of being able to tell others about it. God, we want to pray for all the churches that are in Humboldt County right now doing the same thing. We know that this isn't about us building our own platform, but about the kingdom spreading. And so we continue to pray for other churches all throughout this region, a region that has so much darkness and so much pain, that is in such desperate need for the power of the gospel to transform people's lives and to bring light and life into a dark and dead community. And so we pray for all the churches in Humboldt County that are endeavoring to follow you, to know you in spirit and in truth. And we pray that you'd empower their ministries by the power of the Holy Spirit to be able to spread this message and this joy that we ourselves get to enjoy. God, I want to pray for the people within our church that have their own ministries. Uh, I want to pray for Peter and Leah as they're engaged with uh, FCA and wanting to reach out to athletes all throughout Humboldt County and Del Norte County and all of uh, this kind of corner of Northern California that they're engaged in. I just pray that you would empower them to be fruitful um, and not just in a, in a humanly speaking way that they'd be able to look at and see money coming in and people joining, although those things are important and we pray for those too, but that they would be able to see genuine transformation in the lives of athletes um, by the power of your gospel, God, and that they would be able to rejoice in the work that you do through them and uh, in this county. God, I want to pray for Rick and Helen right now and the, the ministry that they have to teachers. Uh, the field of teaching right now is such a dark place, and there's so much need for the gospel to make an impact in the lives of teachers. Um, and with so many people uh, writing off teachers and writing off the education system, uh, we just pray that you would continue to work in those people's lives, and we pray that you'd use Rick and Helen in that capacity, that you would give them words to speak that would be encouragement and life to teachers in Humboldt County, and that they would be drawn to you and drawn to know you and the power of your gospel, God. God, I thank you for all the people in our church who serve in so many different ways, in both formal and informal ways, as they seek to live out the truth of being your ambassadors of reconciliation. And we just pray that uh, you'd be in working in each and every one of their lives right now. We love you, Jesus, and it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Kids are dismissed.
Good morning. In the last part of the 20th century, there was a popular radio broadcast that happened every day involving a man named Paul Harvey. And what he started in the 70s was a little, little series that dealt with people or events that we all knew about. But he probed and filled in background information, and then he finished it by saying, and now you know the rest of the story. And it might be a person, and he could go back into their background and explain things that we would never associate with that celebrity, or it might be the other way around where he would tell us about a person and then identify them. Or it might have been an event that we knew was an important event, but he would fill in either what happened before or what happened after to tie it in in a new way in, in things. Well, today we're going to have a topical sermon on the rest of the story. A topical sermon is different from what we normally do. Normally we have expository sermons where you take a passage and you go through it and explain it, etc. You are in danger when we do a topical sermon because that's a list of proof texts. Now you're safe in the sense that Pastor Aaron told me I only had two hours. But other than that, I've tried to pick the best verses uh, that cover this material, and, but I'd suggest to you that if you have the time, and of course you do this afternoon, to save me doing it now, you might want to read John chapter 13, 14, 15, and 16, and Hebrews 7, 8, 9, and 10, and I won't do that now. <laughs> but uh, as Sally read today and David read last week and uh, led us in doing the Apostles' Creed, I want to point out to you this morning where we're going with the rest of the story. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. And we celebrated that last week, and what do we call it? Easter. Exactly. But it goes on. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. Uh, before we revised the language, it used to say, God the Father Almighty, which I loved because the word in the Old Testament for God Almighty is El Shaddai, and in the New Testament, Ponto Crater should be in there. But anyway, look, Christ ascended. We don't have an ascension service. Some churches actually do. Uh, but let's look at the ascension in Acts chapter 1, where Luke, who wrote both the Gospel of Luke and also the book of Acts as uh, a continuation uh, of the history of the early church, Acts 1, 1 through 11, covers the ascension. In the first book, O Theophilus, I've dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up, after he'd been given, or he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. Look, look at that. All the way through the Gospels, these 12 guys, what are they called? It starts with D. Exactly. But now something is changing. They're no longer going to be following Jesus as disciples. They're going to be apostles, which means those officially sent. And they're getting ready for that. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. He put him through a 40-day apostle boot camp. In Luke 24, Luke tells us that they spent all their time going over 
what we would call the Old Testament and showing all the work that Jesus was to do. Not in the New Testament, no for God so loved the world. This is Old Testament material that confirmed for them that Jesus was the long-awaited Messiah who would not only die for their sins to be forgiven, but also credit them with righteousness that came from God on their behalf. And he did it for 40 days. Now, Scripture doesn't tell us why 40 days, but it's interesting. When Moses went up on the mountain to get the Ten Commandments, guess how many days he was there? When Noah went out in the boat, oh, the ark, it rained for how long? When Jesus was tempted by the devil in the wilderness, any guess how many days he was out there? Right. So for 40 days, they're at Apostles Boot Camp uh, with Jesus, and they speak about the kingdom of God. Uh, in the New Testament, kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven, my kingdom, uh, 107 times that expression is used. Now, if you have a kingdom, you have two things. It takes two things to make a kingdom. First is king. king. Second is Subject. right, exactly. You, you stand right up here, Rick. You <laughs> got it going. So we're getting set up for some things here. A shift in mindset from following Jesus around and saying, what do you want me to do next, to being the guys. And a reminder that this is bigger than just walking around Galilee or walking around Jerusalem. This is the kingdom of God we're talking about. Okay, while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he had said, you heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. That was Pentecost, and it occurred 10 days after this account that we're reading in the first chapter. So when he had come together, they asked him, now remember, he's just told them what they're apostles now. And yet, these guys were never at the top of the charts in understanding Jesus first time around. So when they come together, they ask him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He, he said to them, it's not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Uh, in John chapter 16, Jesus says to them when they don't quite understand everything, when I speak to you in figures of speech, you don't get it. So let me try to be as clear as possible. And here he's as clear as possible when he says, remember, it's not an earthly kingdom. You've got work to do. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. That would be the ascension. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, Two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into the heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. That's the ascension, and that's the part of the rest of the story that we're going to look at this morning. Uh, how many of you have ever been to a church service that celebrated the Ascension? Well, you three are excused from listening to the rest of this. <laughs> Look, this is a big deal. Christ departs after, as I said, if we'd read John 13, 14, 15, and 16. 
and uh, the other references, after he's told them he was going to his father, and he goes, and still two, apparently, angels have to interpret it for the apostles. Does this look like a group of guys who are ready to go institute the New Testament church and conquer the earth in the name of the kingdom of God? No. That's why the 10 days later. But what you need to know is that just like we celebrate Easter and every single Christian knows the resurrection and the crucifixion are all part of God's plan of salvation. Could you say that about the ascension? Absolutely. It was a part of God's plan of salvation. Now I'm going to give you a few verses. Don't make me go all the way through. Uh, John 3. When you hear John 3, what verse comes to your mind? 3.16. Backing it up to John 3.13. And here's what Jesus says. No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Uh, that's even more clarified later in John where he explains that lifted up isn't on the cross. The lifted up is lifted up from the earth. Let's, let's try to paraphrase that. Jesus says... Unless I ascend to heaven, and you, and you believe that, too bad for you. The ascension is part of God's plan of salvation. What's the number one problem for Christians today? And probably 20 years ago, 40 years ago, 60. Assurance. Confidence. A good conscience. Those are our problems. We keep forgetting that. Jesus tells us right here that when he is lifted up, it will be completed. John 6. We look at John 6 because Peter says, where else can we go? You have the words of eternal life. But Jesus, conscious that his disciples grumbled at some of the things he was teaching, said to them, does this cause you to stumble? What then if you see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? Do you notice how in the travels of Jesus around with his disciples, it's just a matter of normal speaking to talk about Jesus ascending into the heavens. He talks about it like he does about the fact that he's going to be killed and raised from the dead. In fact, listen to these. Well, is Luke up there already? No. Good. Before you put the next slide up, when the days were approaching for his blank, he was determined to go to Jerusalem, and he sent messengers on ahead of him and they went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make arrangements for him. When the days were approaching for his what, did he go to Jerusalem? How would you, how would you fill that in? I'm sorry? Death. Death. Death is a good one. Any other choices? Resurrection. Resurrection's a good one. Now let's look at what it said. When the days approached for his ascension. You see, Jesus was thinking about ascending to heaven. We think of his death and his resurrection. We don't so often think of his ascension. I got a quote here from a guy named William Hendrickson. Those of you who are under... 60, probably don't know who he is. One of the greatest Bible commentators of all days. If you quote somebody newer than he, they probably read him. 
So he says, Luke writing long after Calvary had become history does not say before his death, but before his ascension. He realized the cross was a stepping stone to the crown. You see, the ascension's a big deal. It was a big deal to Jesus. If it was a big deal to Jesus, should it be a big deal to you? Of course, because it's part of God's plan of salvation. If Jesus had been raised from the dead, resurrected from the ground, and stuck around, there would have been no ascension. And God's plan of salvation wouldn't have been completed because we know that when Jesus went to the cross, he went to the cross to shed his blood to pay for our sin. Correct? That's called atonement. Now, you Old Testament aficionados already know this, so I won't read Leviticus 16. But Leviticus 16 sets out the rules for the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. And it's, well, actually, I'll tell you what we will do. We will read the first seven verses of Hebrews 9 because they summarize it. Now, even the first covenant had regulations for worship in an earthly place of holiness. For a tent was prepared, the first section in which were the lampstand, the table, and the bread of presence is called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a second section called the most holy place. He's describing the tabernacle or the temple, and it was like this platform, this table here, and this part from my tablet on over was the holy place. This where the white sheets are. That was the most holy place. Only once a year did the high priest, the chief priest, go into the most holy place. And, in, and to get there, he had to move a curtain, which you may recall was rent, was torn in the temple when Jesus was crucified. Once a year he went in there and he made sacrifices and sprinkled blood, lots of blood, from a couple of different animals and it involved a scapegoat and all this, but it was quite a ritual. And when it was done at that particular moment, your sins appeared forgiven before God, but then as you left and yelled at your wife, <laughs> You were out for another year. So, behind the second curtain was a second section called the Most Holy Place, having the golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant covered on all sides with gold, in which was a golden urn holding the manna and Aaron's staff that budded and the tablets of the covenant. Above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy, mercy seat. Of these things... We cannot now speak in detail. He had the same problem as I do doing Leviticus. These preparations having thus been made, the priests go regularly into the first section, performing their ritual duties. But into the second, only the high priest goes. And he, once a year, and not without taking blood, which he offers for himself, and for the unintentional sins of the people. <coughs> Excuse me. So this is the atonement ceremony conducted by the chief priest once a year. And it involves basins of blood from uh, an ox and a goat that are slain. And the, the rules and regulations that he says... Uh, he's not going to go into detail on. I'm not either, but there were a lot of them. And they all had to be followed. And when the chief priest came out, uh, the people cheered. Hebrews 9.11. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, through a greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not 
in this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, <coughs> but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. What is the author of Hebrews saying? He's saying that the ascension of Christ brought him into the heavens, which had been copied to make the temple tabernacle stuff. And he cleansed and, and sacrificed in the real temple of God, in the presence of God, and as he says here, secured our eternal redemption. What if his blood had stayed on earth? We talk a lot about the fact that without the shedding of blood, there can be no salvation. But the blood was delivered to the right place. Jesus said he had to go. Why? To complete the atonement just as he changed the Passover into Easter, just as he changed the Last Supper into the Lord's Supper, he changed Yom Kippur to an eternal guarantee of our redemption. What is an eternal guarantee of your redemption worth to you? And how often do you doubt it for some stupid reason? I try to be nice about that, but I can't think of another word. You see, Jesus, to put it vulgarly, delivered the goods. He presented his blood to the Father, and you are atoned for forever. Now, the author of Hebrews repeats himself, so we'll go along with him, in that same chapter, in the 23rd verse. Thus, it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God why on our behalf <coughs> oh boy excuse me nor was it to offer himself repeatedly remember the once a year thing that the high priest did for he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world but as it is He's appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. I apologize for my cough. So what, what is the author of Hebrews saying? He's saying that when Jesus told his disciples, you're going to be apostles, you're going to go forward, I have an appointment with my father. I'm returning in order to complete the atonement process in order that you might be guaranteed eternal redemption. That's what that little rest of the story talks about. Perhaps one of the most important parts of the ascension, and, and, and we'll talk about a couple more in the time remaining, uh, is this whole idea of the, the blood of Christ cleansing before God in order that we might be delivered from our sin. That makes him our high priest. Uh, and he performed that as he was delivered into heaven. Now, there are lots of high priest verses, but let me just share a couple with you. Hebrews 2. He had to be made like his brothers in every respect 
so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation, let's call that atonement, for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he's able to help those who are being tempted. I'm going to cough again. Okay, what, what's he saying? He's saying that Jesus had to be a human being in order to pay the sacrifice for human beings. That's us. And in order to be our faithful high priest, he had to be human because priests were human. When we get back to uh, 1 Peter, we'll hear that we're a royal priesthood. What that means is that we have a great high priest, and we can speak to God through our high priest uh, directly. When we finish our prayers, oftentimes we say, in Jesus' name. Well, they're all in Jesus' name. If we're uh, saved by him, he stands at or sits at God's right hand as our high priest and delivers our prayers. Uh, and he understands our prayers because he lived a human life. And he came and dwelt amongst us as one of us. It makes him a merciful and faithful high priest. <clears throat> Have you ever gotten yourself into trouble because of something you did that was wrong? and stupid well, if it was wrong it was stupid but uh, let me just see a few more heads nod so I know that you heard what I said because if your head's not nodding yes you have you see Jesus understands those situations he was tempted but he was without sin so that his sacrifice would be acceptable to God and never have to be done again, never have to be done for himself, but for you. But he understands you. When people, in, in my time as an active pastor, I would go to see people who had done dumb and stupid and bad, and they didn't go to church because they were embarrassed or because they were trying to hide from God. He had to be made like his brothers so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest. He wants to give you mercy for your wrong and your dumbness. He wants you to know that he has paid the price for your sin and delivered his blood in the holiest of holies, in heaven itself, on your behalf. And he sees you, uh, in Ephesians, seated in the heavenlies with him. He's already got you there. And yet, often, we miss that. If, if you have trouble seeing Christ dying for you, then jump to the ascension and see him deliver in heaven his own blood on your behalf it's done I once heard a man say I am so mad at God that if I could I'd give my salvation back well that's profound he realized he couldn't give his salvation back Christ had already paid the price for his salvation couldn't give it back if he wanted to an, an author of Hebrews wants us to understand that Christ understands us. Hebrews 4, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who is, in every respect, has been tempted as we are, but without sin. Repeating that idea, except that he talks about holding fast to our confession. There are two C words 
besides confession, that appear in the book of Hebrews. Conscience is one. We're rid of an evil conscience. We have a good conscience before God. Part of our problems with assurance are, well, God couldn't love me because I'm a bad person. He knew you were a bad person when he chose you. But because Christ has paid the price for those sins of yours that you're worrying about, we're to have a good conscience. If your conscience isn't clear and you're a Christian, you're listening to the wrong, wrong person. That would be the D-E, you know what they call it. It's true. Because God doesn't think that way. He sent this faithful high priest, and each day he's in heaven on your behalf. Not only that, but he's the king of the universe. Understand, uh, when Aaron preached on the creed, he made much of uh, Christ's kingship. It's kingdom, kingdom, kingdom. Now, here comes a, a question that I'd like you to think about just a minute. If Christ's kingdom is the world, and the world doesn't look so good, where might you find a kingdom outpost? Thank you. Say it a little louder. The church. We gather together as subjects of the king, right? That makes us a kingdom outpost. The Lord says to my Lord, Psalm 110, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter. Rule in the midst of your enemies. And we pray sometimes when we get together the Lord's Prayer. And we say, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Ah. And how is that supposed to happen? Because we're offering ourselves as his servants. We read the scriptures and we go to apostle boot camp. And then we learn our role in the kingdom, just as Jesus told his former disciples, then apostles, when they said, hey, we're going to do political stuff? What did he say? You're going to be my witnesses. You who do wrong, stupid things, but know that they've all been forgiven, are going to be my witnesses. Because you have a king, and you're in his kingdom. You're his subjects. And not only did he bring you unto himself, but as his subjects, you obey the king's orders. That's what we're called to do. I love the Daniel passage, Daniel 7. Uh, have, have you preached through Daniel at all? In, Daniel is a, um, an apocalyptic book. That means that it's revelation language, and it's got uh, all kinds of visions and uh, dreams and that kind of thing in it. And in one of Daniel's dreams... I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. What would you call it coming to the Ancient of Days? Ascension! And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom so that all peoples, nations, and language should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. I don't think I have to say anything else about that, do I? A lot of heads shaking. No, you don't have to say any more. Look! 
Christ ascended in order that he could assume dominion over the whole place. His former disciples, then called apostles, but not yet ready, said, are we going to have a kingdom of Israel? No. I'm going to heaven to be the king of the universe. That's our king. And, and we sing worship songs and we hear his word and we're deathly silent about the whole thing. There's a guy, I'll call him Bruce because that was his name. And um, when I was in my last year of seminary, uh, I was working in a church that was a church plant. And it was kind of like our church here. You know, it was varied in age, and it was, it was a neat place. And it was brand new, and it was growing and all that. And I also worked in a church that was made up of 13 old people, probably as old as I am now. And that's all there was. But it began to grow, and we started to get some folks uh, and I remember a girl named Janet. She was a young, single nurse. And she came to the church. Well, the church plant had a Christmas uh, pageant for the kids. Have you ever seen one of those? You know, it's, it's, it's fun. And so I invited all of the people from the older church to come over and see the the kids thing because they didn't have yet any kids other than mine and God was gracious and added a bunch of a little well I'll tell you stories about that sometime but anyway Janet who went to the old people church and Bruce went to the new church plant and Bruce was I thought a pretty pious guy and Janet was a pretty pious girl they both knew their stuff and all that kind of thing. Bruce was an inhalation therapist. That's the guy that comes to your room, makes you breathe in the hospital and all that. And Janet was a nurse in the hospital, a uh, general duty nurse. When came time for the, the kids program, Bruce was inside he turned around as Janet came in the door, and he said, Janet. And she said, Bruce? And they both said together the most telling thing, I didn't know you were a Christian. You see how sad that is? Now let's go back and look at this again. And him was given dominion and a glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. And two solid people turned to one another, having worked next to each other, and said, Funny, I didn't know you were a Christian. Couldn't it leak out just a little bit? Couldn't, couldn't it slide into your conversation? Could you, when you're having your munchies for breakfast, think of a great little line to segue into dropping the fact that you were at church yesterday or something to get the conversation rolling? Uh, if we claim Jesus as king, then the benefits of that are great. We serve the ruler of the universe. But the word there is serve the world ruler of the universe. And that brings us to what Jesus did about preparing us for that. You've heard of the Holy Spirit. We talk about the Holy Spirit in the creed. Okay. The Holy Spirit didn't just show up at Pentecost. The Holy Spirit had always been here. You read Genesis 1, there's the Holy Spirit. You read in the Old Testament, people became believers. You read the New Testament that Abraham had the gospel preached to him. Uh, you hear in, in the parts that Nate will have to fix about Noah in the... Anyway, um, the Holy Spirit has always been here 
flipping the switch on people, regenerating people. That didn't just start at Pentecost. What happened at Pentecost was the Spirit came to do new things, to take those useless new apostles and make those guys real apostles, to have Peter stand up and deliver the sermon that when, at least when I was in seminary, um, all of us lamented when we were in preaching class saying, we'll never get a sermon like Peter's where 3,000 people were converted. But that's the power that the Holy Spirit brought on them. Here's what Jesus told his disciples in John 16. I really do hope you'll read 13, 14, 15, and 16. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it's to your advantage I go away, for if I don't go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. The world, it was going to be a worldwide thing when the Spirit came, and Jesus says, if I don't go... He won't come. So now, do me this favor. Look to your left. That's that way, okay? Now look to your right. Do you see people? Mm-hmm. They are all here part of this kingdom that the helper, the spirit, has created. These outposts of God's kingdom. Acts 2, where Peter preached his famous sermon, he says, This Jesus God raised up again, to which we are all witnesses. Therefore, having been exalted. Did you know, can you think of a word that starts with A, S, C, that would okay, put it in there for exalted? And by the way, it is the same word that sometimes... Our translations use ascended and sometimes exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth this which you both see and hear. For it was not David who ascended into heaven, there's the ascended word again, but he himself said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool your feet. <clears throat> Christ is not only reigning, but he's also teaching and opening the hearts and minds and eyes of others through the servants of his kingdom, <coughs> which is us. The spirit concentrates all of this in God's kingdom. And again, where is God's kingdom outpost? Right. So the spirit was given to create the New Testament church to bring us together. <coughs> I, I'm going late, so we'll just jump ahead to Ephesians 4. By the way, I wanted to read to you from Ephesians 1, where it uh, God says that the center of it all, with Christ as the head, is the church. And in Ephesians 4, grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and gave gifts to men. And saying it ascended, what does it mean but that he also descended into the lower regions of the earth? He who descended is the one who also, there it is again, ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave, and, and he could have put in here, and he gave through the Spirit coming, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, the teachers, to equip the saints for the works of ministry. Who would the saints be? Us. And what are we equipped for? Works of ministry. 
for building up the body of Christ. And he could have put in there, for building up the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, my kingdom. That's what he calls us to. When do we get to stop? When we all attain the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. When's that happen? Well, we have to go all the way back to Acts chapter 1, verse 11, where the two guys in white said, he's coming again. So now you know at least a part of the rest of the story. We'll wait for his return to complete it. Amen. And now I'd like to uh, invite you to continue in worship with us uh, as a church and the ways that we will continue to do that is we'll sing a couple more songs. Um, we will also respond in worship through giving. And so we recognize that the mission that Jesus has called us to as the church requires time, energy, resources. And one of those resources is our finances. So as the church of Jesus, uh, we want to um, to give toward the mission of continuing uh, to do what Jesus has called us to to do, specifically as, as a local church. And so if you're part of our church family, you're invited to give uh, in response and, and to see that mission continue. Uh, we also worship and uh, through receiving communion. Uh, and this is something that Jesus commanded us to do together uh, as his people until he comes again. Uh, and so uh, if your confession is that Christ is Lord, that Christ is Savior, as we declared in the creed, uh, if, if you serve him, then we uh, invite you to come forward during this next song to, to take communion, to take a cup uh, with bread and a cup with juice, uh, and then take it back to your seat. And then I will come uh, lead after the song, we'll lead in taking it together, receiving it together as believers in Christ. And I do just want to say um, that that if you're not a believer in Christ, if you have not placed your faith in Jesus, that um, that you don't need to feel obligated to come up. No one's going to look at you strange if you don't come up and to take communion. Communion is for Christians, for those who have placed their faith in Christ. And so um, don't, don't feel an obligation. Uh, this is for Christians to do. And so um, I want to invite you now to stand uh, and we will sing together.
Hear the words of the institution of the Holy Supper of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus, on the night of his arrest, took bread, and after giving thanks to God, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. And with these words, Jesus has commanded all believers to eat this broken bread and to drink this cup in true faith and in the confident hope of his return in glory. In this supper, God declares to us, he declares to us that all our sins are completely forgiven through the one sacrifice of Jesus Christ, which he himself accomplished on the cross once for all. He also declares to us that the Holy Spirit unites us, grafts us into Christ, who with his true body is now in heaven at the right hand of the Father where he rules and reigns. So every time you eat this bread and you drink this cup, You proclaim the saving death of the risen Lord until he comes. So with thanksgiving, let us offer to God our grateful praise. Christ is the bread of life. And when we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim your death, Lord Jesus, until you come in glory. I invite you to take the bread. This bread is the body of Christ, which is given for you. Do this, remembering him. Take and eat. This cup is the new covenant sealed by Christ's blood, which was shed that the sins of many might be forgiven drink from it, all of you. Glory to God, the Father, who brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ and crowned him with glory and honor. Glory to God, the Son, who lives to plead our cause at the right hand of God and who will come again to make all things new. Glory to God, the Holy Spirit, who brings us the taste of the good word of God and the power of the age to come. Praise and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor, power and might be to our Lord forever and ever. Amen. I invite you to stand with us once more as we sing Amazing Grace. Grace, how 
You've heard God's word. I charge you as you go forth to go forth as a confident person of good conscience, trusting in the risen Lord who has paid the price and delivered the blood to the Holy of Holies. And to do that, receive his blessing. Grace, mercy, and peace be upon all those who truly love the Lord Jesus Christ with an undying love. And his people said, Amen. Amen.